So we're going to delve into the, uh, um, a little bit more into the background now of how radio telescopes work um, as an introduction to the next talk um, by Justin, which is going to be a general talk about um, radio astronomy. But let's start off with uh, just um, talking a little bit more about radio telescopes itself, um, although we are more interested in the data. Um, it does actually, it's, it's actually very in interesting to see how the engineers actually construct um, the telescopes. So, um, when it comes to astronomy, uh, the only astronomy we can actually do from the ground, so from terrestrial, is optical and radio astronomy. Um, and uh, optical is, it has a very small, actually, um, region that it can observe over. Well, the um, the radio region is very broad and it does give radio astronomers um, a very big advantage. And the fact is that radio astronomy being a fairly new science, um, the pioneering radio astronomers had the opportunity to um, observe, uh, observe all kinds of new objects like quasars and radio galaxies and pulsars. Um, and unlike optical, um, not everything was what? Um, so instead of a ball of fire burning like a star, they could actually see cold stuff like the interstellar medium and the extremely cold cosmic microwave background radiation. Uh, so let's have a look at the spectrum. This is the spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum is a large spectrum. Um, and what we will see is that on the shorter frequencies, or on the higher frequencies, the short wavelengths, um, that the atmosphere is actually in our way. It does not allow the signals to actually pass through. So we can't observe them. We are down here, we're on the ground, we can't see them. So in order to do uh, ob observations, uh, we have to be above the, the atmosphere. So space astronomy has become fairly um, important to us to have multi-wavelength astronomy. And now with space telescopes, so telescopes mounted on satellites, um, we are actually able to do um, gamma ray, x-ray and ultraviolet observations that we can't do from, uh, from the ground. Then you have the small little region here, which is visible. This is where the optical um, region works, and you can actually see the colors there as well. Um, then you have the infrared again because of dust, um, dust reflecting all the, um, uh, refracting all the signals away. Um, the, we can't observe that unless we're above the atmosphere. And then you have radio. Radio starts at about um, 10 megahertz and ends as high as 1 terahertz. So it is a, a very broad frequency spectrum that we have the luxury to observe in, in radio astronomy. And this is just an open window um, that we can see through the atmosphere. So we can use terrestrial um, telescopes and our biggest problem is not the atmosphere. Our biggest problem is people, um, is, is actually communication, those kind of things. So people using um, the frequency and sending out very loud signals on the frequencies of our very weak um, extraterrestrial signals we want to observe. So because we have such a broad brand, I mean going from 10 megahertz to 1 terahertz is extremely broad spectrum. The thing is then you can't have one radio telescope. We can't build a telescope to observe the band. Um, so we have a range of telescopes and you can use one, so if the one is best suited, you can use one, but often you will see a combination, so people will observe the same target on multiple um, telescopes in order to get a range to, to exploit the, the benefits of every one of the, the telescopes. Um, now the first telescope here um, is going to, I'm going to highlight is actually this uh, old horn telescope. So this is basically a horn uh, with a receiver inside, okay. And this is probably one of the most sensitive telescopes that we have. The um, thing is, it's a, a single dish. Um, we don't have any phase information. Um, it is relatively small in terms of the standards of today. But it is very, very sensitive. And this actually uh, is an image of the uh, um, own um, antenna at Bell Labs that was used by Peneus and Wilson in 1965 to actually um, observe, and basically they discovered the three Kelvin cosmic background um, radiation. 
but by far the most common telescope we have, a radio telescope, is going to be your parabolic dish. Um, so dish telescopes are um, very useful because of their relatively large aperture. They can give you uh, um, fairly reasonable uh, sensitivity and angular resolution over a range of frequencies. So you're not stuck to one frequency, you have a range of frequencies um, that you can observe. Obviously, the uh, efficacy of the dish will, um, or this, uh, the surface area that you can use will decrease as you go up in frequency, but still it gives you a range, which is very useful for your wider band observations. But the problem is, in our hunt for angular resolution, they've become too small. What are the problems? Well, there's a, there's a very uh, hard limit to building a very large um, single dish. We want larger and larger apertures so we can have smaller and smaller angular resolution. But this is a mechanical structure. Um, and the, the largest current steerable dish, which means a movable dish, is the 100 meter um, Green Bank Telescope. Um, and the problem with these big, um, extremely big telescopes are basically gravitational sagging. That's a lot of weight. And the GBT itself has, uh, this is the first, uh, the third generation, because the other two fell down. It's, it's just um, structural um, fatigue, because they are so, so uh, enormous. Um, also in terms of what we require, they provide us with limited sensitivity. So although they are an improvement, they are better in sensitivity. They still provide us limited sensitivity. They have a relatively small um, field of view in terms of our scientific needs. Um, and then they have a limited pointing um, accuracy. And that is, you can imagine the gears that's necessary to, to actually uh, drive and control and point that telescope to targets. So, you know, um, there are limitations to all. You do get the bigger ones like FAST and recently deceased Arecibo, where they are actually fixed and you can make them very big. But again, you have limitations there. Um, the other thing about our single dishes is that uh, um, they become strongly confusion limited due to continuum sensitivity limitations um, at below 10 gigahertz, where we do actually have quite a number of target observations. So in the, the, the case of Meerkat, um, we are going for the engineering concept. So how do you make them bigger? How do you make them bigger if mechanically you can't anymore? Um, and that's where interferometry steps in. So building uh, um, uh, synthesis arrays where you use a number of smaller antennas like Meerkat, where we have or moderately um, large 15 meter um, uh, tele uh, antennas. And we, through engineering signal processing concepts, combine the signals of those to um, synthesize uh, a telescope that will have the aperture of the longest baseline. These give um, extreme accuracy, pointing accuracy, tracking accuracy. They give us uh, a lot of information very impressive angular resolution um, sensitivity that we get. Um, and uh, um, then if, if you imagine that for Meerkat at our band, we, our longest baseline is eight kilometers, which gives us um, a seven arc minute um, resolution, which is incredible. Um, also, because you have the, the smaller dishes, I don't have the same problem that I would on a, on a large dish. So if I have a large dish, um, a big dish like GBT 100 meter dish, I'm going to have um, thermal um, differences between the one side of the dish and the other side of the dish as one gets more sunlight. That's going to affect the phase, it's going to affect my signal. Um, the other thing also that I might have is there if there's RFI, I have a single feed on this very large dish, all the, the um, signals get focused. Um, onto that, that single feed, so I'm going to pick up RFI, I'm going to be more sensitive. And then I have this ginormous umbrella in the middle of nowhere, so if there is a wind gust coming out, it's going to be very sensitive to, to actually getting damaged by that wind gust, or getting affected by the wind gust wobbling. Um, if I have a, smaller, or a set of smaller dishes, they're less affected. So because they're small, I don't have the temperature variations across the, the apertures, the individual antenna apertures. Um, also RFI, because it's generally, um, terrestrial RFI is generally directional. So a certain section will be affected, but another section may not be affected as badly. And then um, obviously because it is slightly smaller, we still have to be very careful about our environment, especially wind, but it's not as susceptible um, and we, we can actually tolerate a lot more using these uh, uh, interferometers.
but they're not the end all and be all. We still need the single dishes. Why do we why do we combine them with the single dishes? Because a baseline is a spacing between two antennas. Okay, there's always going to be a distance between two antennas, irrespective of how you position these two. The projected projected baseline is always going to have a distance. Well, in a single dish, there is there is zero separation. You just have a single dish. So we need the single dish observations to fill in our zero spacings, to fill in that component for us. And also, they are very useful if we go to observations that's time domain um, observations that's not as sensitive to uh, um, continuum, uh, uh, the time-dependent continuum sources um, actually causing confusion. Okay, so uh, things like our pulsars and those kind of things. Um, for them, yes, there's nothing like a single dish. Uh, so there, there is definitely an advantage to combining our telescopes. So because Meerkat is a uh, is, is an interferometer array, let's just go slightly more into interferometry and how these things work and how the telescope actually observes. So throughout the morning, I've been talking about the two dishes. Um, in this case, you will see them looking upright. That's Zenith. Okay. Um, and then a plane wave coming in. So we assume the waves we observe, the, the energy we observe, comes in as literally planar waves. And the question is, how can we make that assumption? Because what we know is that if you have an object and it is radiating energy, it's going to go out in sort of a, a spherical region, um, expanding, slowly expanding from the source with the energy contributing outwards. Um, so how can we assume a, a plane wave? And uh, for us, that basically is just a limit. It's what we call the far field distance. So as this um, the circle, this bubble of energy, this wave expands away from the origin of the energy, the bubble becomes larger and larger and larger. And then if you're looking only on a small section of this bubble, it starts to become flat. Okay, so you stop seeing the curvature of the wave and it looks flat. And uh, that is actually set by the um, diameter of the dish and then also the frequency, the, the wavelength so of, of the uh, signal you're trying to observe. And then as long as the signal is this distance away from you, so it's far enough away from you, you know the signal that you're going to measure is going to come in as a flat um, planar wave. If you actually observe targets as closer than your far field distance, you are actually going to start seeing the, uh, um, the curvature of the, the wave. And then this assumption of ours of observing planar waves is going to be false. And what you will see often is that you're going to introduce phase errors as the various different sections of the wave hits the surface not in line but slightly out of phase because of the curvature, slightly different times, you're going to see phase errors being introduced by the fact that you are not meeting our assumption of far field distance. So that's why we can say we're observing a plane wave. And let's just be honest, most things, and space is large, space is enormous. So most things we're going to, celestial objects we're going to be interested in, is going to be far enough that this assumption of ours will hold. So again, we're going back to the single dish. We have a single dish and the plane wave is coming in and is going to um, be monitored over the surface of my dish. So um, as we see in, uh, saw in, in, in the FFT, basically your illumination pattern um, is going to be a square. So you're going to have illumination on where you're going to have detection on your dish and then um, you're going to have ground. So there's nothing there to measure. So you have a box car and we know that uh, what we observe is the Fourier, okay, so inverse of a Fourier is going to be a sink, and this is literally what we're observing. We saw the diffraction pattern, the, the array disk pattern that we actually get when we took the FFT of a flat circular object. Um, and from that we get our beam shape. So we've been talking throughout the morning about having a beam shape. Um, and the size of the beam shape setting, the amount of resolution that we have so we can separate out um, targets and resolve them out from, from each other. And this is how we get it. So if we take our sync function, we take the absolute value, we get the power spectrum. This defines our beam for us. And this is a D, the, the beam for a primary beam. This is the beam that our dish gives us, so our aperture. <coughs> 
Um, and here what is important is the, what we call the, the beam of PowerPoint. And this is where our separation, our really limit lies for angular resolution for separating out um, to uh, individual objects in our image. Now, you know, let's be honest about it. Um, we actually don't have a very nice square wave. There's always going to be energy spillover. So you're going to be more efficient in the center. Um, it's going to taper out to the edges. And there's always going to be some energy coming in from the ground. Why? Because the ground is hot. Remember, we said 300 Kelvin ambient temperature. And that's what the ground is. So more realistically, what we see is actually a, co a cosine taper. Um, but again, uh, if we take the FFT of this tapered function, we do see, again, a sync function. And the uh, um, total power of this gives us a power spectrum, gives us a beam shape. And um, in here, you will recognize, if you um, are in radio um, astron uh, astronomy, you will recognize very standard equation where we say the half power point is 1.2 times the wavelength over the diameter or the baseline length. Um, so we see we have this uh, inverse relation or, or this direct relation um, between, between our wavelength and our actual uh, um, beams, beam shape or beam size. So again, just getting back to how this affects us, for every time, if you look at a point source, um, in a point source, um, the uh, measurements is directly related to the flux. So what I get out of the correlator is directly related to, to the flux. Um, so for every source, what I will have is this convolution with beam and my source flux. Um, and if the beam is broad, like in this right-hand corner, right-hand graph, all you will see is this big blob. You won't be able to distinguish. It may look like there's something, but they can't be clearly distinguished. Then as my beam becomes narrower and narrower and narrower, what I start to see is separation of the two. And then when I get to my half power, to, to my Rayleigh limit, where I have this 1.22, okay, that's when I now can clearly distinguish the two sources and I can um, resolve out that there are indeed two sources in that single blob. Okay, so that is um, angular resolution and relating to our half power point for our beam. So when we do the observations, um, we the example so far has all been single, uh, well, basically just a signal. We're looking at one dimension just, just for a signal. Um, but we are actually um, observing with this flat surface, this, this aperture. So um, let's just revisit that again. Um, for a parabolic dish, we're going to have a flat surface. And we're going to say, OK, so let's define an x, y, and then z being perpendicular to my x, y plane. Um, and because everything I do is actually set by the wavelength of the signal that I am observing, I'm going to say let's define x and y in units of wavelength. And I'm going to define two units, u and v. So now you should start remembering the uv coordinates. So I'm going to define my coordinates u and v, where u is actually x divided by wavelength, so x in units of wavelength and y divided by wavelength. So y in, in units of wavelength. That defines to me now the uv plane in terms of my flat aperture. Um, and now I just need to position my uv plane. Remember, the uv plane is always going to be positioned perpendicular to my source. Okay. Um, so z is always going to point directly. So there's going to be a direction vector s0 no, uh, that is or let me rather call it a pointing vector is north that's going to point in the direction of my source. And I need to relate that to my actual source on the sky. And I'm going to define their L and M coordinates. So this is going to be my source coordinate system. And their L is going to be um, sine theta of x. And M is, going, M is going to be sine theta of y. So that's how I'm going to relate um, my x, y to uv and l and m. So now I've related my two, my source, my um, source surface and my observational surface. Where I measure the uv, I know now how it maps to my target. And the relation between them is, is um, written down here where I have my beam map and then the, uh, the relation to them. And you can see it is a clear Fourier relation. This is, in fact, 
a 2D Fourier relation between the UV plane and the LM coordinate system of my target. And this is very important actually um, when we do imaging because remember we measure the UV, we need to do the inverse Fourier to actually get our images out, our actually true sky images. So just again to remind ourselves, we have larger amp um, aperture, we want larger aperture because uh, if we look at the FFT concept, then the synthesized beam, the larger the uh, my, uh, baseline I have, the more, the narrower, the more localized my beam is, the higher um, angular resolution I have. But it also does affect then the, uh, the size of the sky I can view because my, my solid angle is actually just um, a square of my half power beam width with a constant in front is him in a Gaussian. Um, again, so we don't have these clean sharp edges. They're just here for illustration. We have the tapering, but it looks the same if you project them from the top um, with some spillover. So how does all this work? All right, cool. So let's start pointing the dishes. That's generally a good idea. So let's say we have the source, it's in that direction, and we have a wave, a plane wave, coming from that source. And it's going to be observed by our telescope, and our telescope is going to be pointed towards it. Every UV plane is going to, to be pointed towards that, okay? So we have it perpendicular. Now here's where things get a little bit more interesting, is that when we're pointing away from Zenith, you will see that the plane wave will actually reach the one antenna, before it reaches the other antenna. Okay, so I have my projected baseline, I have the distance, um, and I, in this case it's just running from antenna um, 1 to antenna 2, so here's my baseline. Okay, I'm I know in what direction I'm going to point, so this is going to be my pointing vector, and both of them are going to point in that direction, but I have a slight time offset. So if I just simply measure them and I take the signal I measure here and the signal I measure here and I correlate them, I'm not going to get the maximum correlation. Maximum correlation is going to be when I measure, say, here and here, okay? So when I have them in sync, that is going to be my maximum correlation. That's going to be um, the best combination of the signal in order to retrieve my, sig uh, my, my original signal. So what do I do now? Well, I have to delay my one signal. And because I know where my telescope is and I know where my source is, I can actually calculate how long it will take the wave from this location to actually be measured by the other telescope. And um, what I do there is I simply add a slight delay to the measurement of the signal here. So although the signal reaches this telescope, I'm just going to be uh, wait a little while before I actually do the measurement and combine the two signals. So that's a geometric delay. It's literally a compensation for the fact that the two are not um, pointing in the same direction in a planar fashion. So I can't do this, I have to do this. Okay, so I'm just compensating for that. So that's going to be the first one that we do. So this in the correlator itself, we delay the signals until we have all of them in sync using Fourier components, okay? And then we're gonna correlate all the signals. When we correlate the signals, um, as this target is moving, we're going to have in-phase, out-of-phase as they go on, and we're going to have this um, interference pattern. So for, for single baseline, we have this interference pattern that is generated. We can see there's information in there. Um, we can see we have um, correlation in there, so there's definitely something in there. We saw this in one of the FFT notebooks as well, where you just have the strikes. Um, but what we do have here is actually um, the envelope amplitude. And the correlation amplitude is very important. Four point source. The voltages that I measure, the um, Every one of these antennas, ah, oh, this is something I should mention, sorry. We are, in Meerkat, we have a homogeneous array so far, which means all my antennas are, the same, are similar, okay? They're both the same, they're constructed the same, they run the same type of electronics. So I'm going to assume that they are the same. All the antennas work and operate the same and perform the same. So, um, all my measurements, there's no need for me to actually address the voltage measurements directly coming out of the array because they're all going to be similar, okay? So I'm just going to combine the, the, the signals to correlation without doing anything on the front end. So in case that popped out, the reason I'm just assuming combining signals is because I have 
a homogeneous array, which means the same antennas all over the array. So that's when I correlate them, I get a correlation amplitude. And for point source, this amplitude is directly related to the flux. Um, and this is again where we have the averaging over time. I'm not only going to have um, my source, remember there's a lot of junk that I add to my signal. The one is my dish, it's going to add to me this diffraction pattern it, it likes to add. Um, the way I sample is going to add some noise. My system has noise, the ground has noise. Um, and then I have a lot of continuum sources that gives me this flat noise that adds to my signal. And I have to take this correlator output and I have to average it over time, okay? Because remember what we said, um, broadband um, signals do not accumulate the average out over time. So they stay the same. But my signal will actually, if I have a coherent signal, it will become stronger and stronger and stronger. And that means that I can actually observe my signal. So this becomes representative of the flux that I am observing. Okay? So this is how my correlator works in terms of the visibilities that I'm being given. So, okay, this is a single, single baseline. We see that we have, well, we have base information. We have two antennas, okay. There's some correlation there, okay. Given the direction of the fringes, we have some information about where the, uh, if it is a simple, uh, a simple field, where the targets may, may lie. Remember, in our case, we had only two targets. If it gets more complex, it becomes much more complex. We don't have a well-defined beam. It's going to be broad. If I take the power spectrum, it's going to be the envelope of this, so I have a very broad beam. I'm basically going to do blobology, I'm going to see a bunch of blobs. So how can I refine that? Well, I add more antennas. Okay? Remember, we add more baselines, we fill in the UV space. We better define the synthesized beam. So if I add um, one extra antenna, so three antennas, I get three baselines. And already you can start to see the beam shape becoming much narrower. So instead of having just this broad envelope function, I start to see the beam, but I still have interference beams here. So basically I still have a fairly broad beam. If I go to four antennas, now I start to actually do narrow it very much. I have six baselines and we see the, uh, the more definite central feature of the beam popping up to us. Um, that's going to be set by my wavelength and my baseline. They, we know that. If I have few antennas, I'm going to have these negative pockets. These are called our um, side lobes. So the ripples, remember that we get from our sync function because we're measuring the, the Fourier domain. And as I add more and more antennas, um, I correlate more and more signals. Remember, I approximate the beam better, I create a, construct a better beam, and I get a, a better representation of the synthesized beam. And these side lobes decrease. Also, the way that I construct my um, telescope, so you'll see various shapes and sizes to arrays, um, will influence the, the side lobes and the beam shape. Okay. So now I have constructed my beam, I am observing my targets and what we call this the dirty beam. Um, how does this dirty beam actually look and in, in terms of my measurements if I fill in my UV space? So Miak is located in the southern hemisphere um, in the northern cape of South Africa. Um, so we are going to, our beam shape is going to be affected where our target is in the sky. If it is a sudden hemisphere target, obviously um, we are going to fill in more of the UV space and we're going to have a better shaped beam, a more rounded beam, so more symmetrical beam. We like our beam symmetric, um, although in reality it's not always that nice, but symmetric enough is good enough. But as I go north, so here you will look at the, in the left-hand graph, so here is for Meerkat, um, a 12-hour observation of a target that is going to be at minus 60 declination. So it's a very nice um, declination for us to observe. Um, and you can see I have most of my UV filled in my longer baselines, almost sparsely populated, but I have information there, okay? I have information across my UV and I have a very well sampled um, core region, which is exactly what Meerkat is, a tight core and then the longer baselines. But as I move up to my more than northern sources, now we can observe up to plus 30, okay? We do not advertise going above that. But what's going to happen here is I'm not going to see the source for so long. It's going to be just coming above the horizon. It's going to limit my UV coverage. 
And I'm only going to see a very elliptical. It's going to be very, very limited in terms of what I'm seeing. I'm not going to fill in my north cells. And I'm actually just going to be have a very elliptical um, UV coverage. And that's actually going to influence my imaging. Now, there is a number of uh, very strong imaging techniques that can help you. Um, but please be aware of this. That's just simple limitations in terms of pointing and telescope ability to where your telescope is located. Again, combining southern data with northern data for the target, good idea. Now, 3D. All right. So, radio astronomy is the hunt for angular resolution and the infinite desire for longer baselines. So, which means we want broader and broader and longer and longer, um, uh, bigger and bigger telescopes. Which is, and, and this concept, this engineering concept of interferometry is actually what is allowing us to uh, um, build something as big as the Square Kilometer SKA um, telescope, the big um, telescope that's starting to be, uh, become more reality now. But the thing is, what we have, we have assumed so far is that our dishes, although pointing in different directions, are actually located coplanar. Now, in general, if you have an array, they will be built in something like a flat plane or a riverbed to have them fairly flat, you know, so that they are located coplanar. But as we go bigger and bigger, this does not, the, this is not a reality anymore. We will have changes, uh, non coplanar um, antennas. And this is even more uh, relevant when you go out to this big interference like VRBI and uh, VRBA, where they literally use single dishes from all over the globe. And I mean, if you're talking about a curvature, you know, all, all over the globe, we have the big circle. It's going to be a 3D interferometer. It's not going to be a flat plane anymore. So we have to adjust our UVW LM relation a little bit and bring in this third component now. Um, which we're going to define as the W component. So you'll see us moving to UVW, where W is now the component perpendicular to our UV plane. It's going to be in the direction of our pointing, um, our pointing vector. Okay. Um, and then in terms of mapping that new W comp uh, component to the LM level, is now we're going to say, okay, we don't have an LM plane at the source anymore, we're now going to have an L, M and N uh, component. So L and M is still exactly the same, they're still going to be um, the, the sign um, of the, the Y and the, the U, sorry, the, the Y and, and the X represent, uh, relative to U and V. But now I'm actually going to put a cosine directional in there, um, so N is actually going to be the cosine of theta, where theta is if you look here, this is my pointing vector, it's pointing towards my source. S is my direction vector that is pointing towards the object um, I like to, I want to observe. So in my field of view, I'm going to point in a direction, but there's going to be multiple sources. So S is going to be my source observation direction, but now I'm adding a cosine um, component as well, which is going to be my N component. Now this again looks um, tantalizingly like a Fourier, um, but it is very important to note that it is not a Fourier transform. This isn't directly a Fourier transform. Um, it is not a Fourier relation. So um, it's not as simple as simply taking the, the inverse 3D Fourier transform and getting back um, my illumination pattern. Uh, for this, uh, it's slightly more complex. So if you do do the, the wild field, uh, white field imaging and those things where you do actually have to take into account the W components, your imaging becomes um, much more complex. And one of the uh, um, uh, things you can do, one of the techniques that's being applied is actually faceting. Uh, what you do there is you um, take your wide, uh, your, your wild field, uh, field Im um, observation and you would break it out into smaller components called facets. And for every one of this, those facets, the W component will be zero, so every one of those facets will be in a flat plane. And what you can do then is just simply inverse transform those, because that becomes the 2D transform relation again. You just inverse those and eventually merge all your facets to build up um, the final image. So just bear this in mind. So the larger the interferometer, the more complex your entire imaging um, process will become. 
So that's angular resolution. Then also there's the concept of sensitivity. Now sensitivity is the faintest signal that we want to observe. And we want to go fainter and fainter and fainter um, with our bigger telescopes um, to discover new objects out there. Um, so uh, sensitivity is basically defined as the RMS, RMS noise. It's defined by the collecting area. Okay as well as time, time we can spend on target. Remember, we want to build up those signals and bring them up above the noise. So for a single dish, uh, it's basically set by the geometric area. So it's going to be system noise, your geometric area, and the time you have to observe it. It is markedly improved by interferometers, uh, because now suddenly you have all this additional um, aperture that you can use, and it's actually improved by um, the number of baselines, or well, the square root of the number of baselines, that you're going to have an additive advantage. Um, what you will see then is that for a single dish, you will get to observe for a long time. But if you use an uh, uh, interferometer, you are s uh, so much more sensitive that you will um, cut a lot of time um, from observing. So a little bit of time on an interferometer, you can see much fainter objects than a long time on, on a single dish. Um, telescope simply because of your very long baseline and the number of array, uh, number of antennas that you have, your number of baselines. Um, okay, so um, let me just summarize here because I actually want to cut this short, get to a couple of your questions before we bring Justin in for, for a more general, it's going to be a much more relaxing talk than all these very technical talks I've been presenting to you. So in summary, the history of radio astronomy has been one fundamentally driven by engineering questions and engineering demands to have higher uh, angular resolution to somehow construct larger and larger telescopes so that we can see fainter and fainter and finer and finer radio objects out there in the universe. Um, and then because radio um, astronomy basically observes the broader wavelength. So while optical is very, very small wavelengths, um, literally the size of a me by me, we're talking about nano, um, nanometers, um, or micrometers, um, sorry, micrometers, the, the um, radio wavelengths are centimeters, millimeters, centimeters. Um, so it's, it's, it's large. And these large wavelengths, to get the, the sensitivity and the angular resolution we need, we don't instantaneously get it like optical. Uh, we have to observe over time. We have to build up our observations, our frequency component observations, in order to achieve this. So observations take a long time to actually observe. So time is essential. We can, but we can accumulate data. Something optical cannot do. It's very difficult to accumulate data in optical, but in radio we can easily accumulate data over time using our correlator visibilities that, that we get out, and so achieve the angular resolution we need. Um, we, we exploit um, Fourier transform and engineering concepts throughout radio astronomy, both to observe our signals, to align our signals, and to basically synchronize our signals to ensure that we have, we observe uh, and actually detect the best um, signals we can in terms of our observations. Then we use our correlators to combine our signals um, to form synthesized beams that would give us these angular resolutions. Um, and we also then use those combined signals to, to fill in our measurements, which we then ultimately will invert to get our intensity maps. Um, and then obviously, yeah, so just summarizing, it takes time to fill in the UV space, a lot of time, and then your imaging um, is, is very important. And I think here I should say that what you will notice is that um, we continuously talk about the Fourier, and those of you with some knowledge about Fourier knows it is, um, it is computationally expensive. No matter what you do, no matter in what region you work, Fourier is an expensive exercise. Um, so although we use the, the false Fourier algorithms that we have, it's, it's still very expensive. So when you do the data processing, we do tend to, to use um, high-speed computers. Um, we continuously try to improve algorithms to get faster and faster ca uh, calculations um, and try to get uh, around the limitations that the um, assumptions of the false Fourier transform put to us. But it is always uh, an engineering challenge 
for everyone. So then just before closing off, some references. Um, so I've given you a broad oversight of radio telescopes. There is a lot more theory in there in terms of how the antennas actually work, how the beam patterns, um, look, what the beam patterns look like, how the side lobes are defined, how they can be calculated, um, how your shape and the various, so if you have a center feed versus, versus an offset Gregorian influence the beam shape, then also in terms of your correlator. The type of correlator, do you have a FX correlator, XF, when do you make the selection, how does it influence the design of your telescope? All of that is very big engineering challenges. So I give you some references if you are interested in this to follow this further. Is have a look at the fundamentals in radio astronomy and the essential radio astronomy um, links here. Um, there is a lot more detail in terms of the theory. Uh, we are not going to use that going forward because we are focusing on the, the signal processing side, the astronomy side. And then also just again your collab, um, UV coverage notebooks and then your point source sensitivity um, which you saw in the previous slide um, and we're going to see again just to give you some um, indication. And